During our memorial service, we light six candles in memory of the six million victims. The candles are lit by Holocaust survivors or their descendants. We light also a seventh candle by descendants of Holocaust survivors in memory of the Holocaust survivors that perished here in the greater Cleveland area. Conducting the candle lighting ceremony is Muriel Weber, past president of uh, Colisile Foundation, and she's also a second generation. Muriel? Phil and Libby Newman light the first candle. Phil and Libby are the children of Francis and Stanley Newman. Francis was born Cecil Friedel Gelbart in Cobalt, 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 Poland in 1931, the youngest of four children. After the Nazis shut down her father's butcher shop, he secretly continued to provide kosher meat to the community before being dragged off, never to be seen again. Francis's mother also died before the community was liquidated. Francis was lucky to be accompanied in Langen Below work camp by two of her sisters who helped her to survive despite not yet having reached her teens. The three sisters were liberated by the Russians in May 1945 and later reunited with their brother, Arthur. Francis was only 14 years old. The Gelbart siblings crossed the Atlantic to live in America, sponsored by an aunt here in Cleveland. Francis went to Heights High, Heights High School and worked at Higby's department store in their salon as a beautician. One day, a man she was dating introduced her to his cousin Stanley, and it was love at first sight. The couple married in 1950. Francis and her siblings had nine children between them, and eventually all were living in the Cleveland suburbs. The four families would get together most weekends for cookouts or trips to amusement parks, and every summer for vacations to the Canadian mountains. In 1970, Francis and Stanley moved from Cleveland to New Jersey, where Stanley became widely known and even awarded for being the best builder in the state. Stanley and Francis had two children and two grandchildren. Stanley passed away in 2002, Francis passed away in 2018. The Newmans were instrumental in the formation and the early years of the Cole Israel Foundation and in building Green Road Synagogue. Rita Schneider Pollock lights the second candle. Rita was born in 1928 in Volove, Czechoslovakia in the Carpathian Mountains the second, the youngest of five children with two sisters and two brothers. Once the Nazis took power, the Jews of her village were barred from participating in business and attending schools. Rita's oldest brother, Henry, fought the Germans as a part of the Czech army was sent to a forced labor camp in Poland. In 1944, the day after Passover, the SS gave the Jews 30 minutes to pack and locked the Jews in the synagogue, holding them there for three days. Rita recalls that in a nearby field, the SS cut off all of the men's beards before the group was sent to Auschwitz. Upon arrival, Rita witnessed Dr. Joseph Mengele perform a selection. Rita was allowed to pass with her mother and sisters, but did not see her father or her brother ever again. Two months later, the group was sent to Stutthof concentration camp. The women spent the rest of the war doing forced labor at a military airport. The group was liberated by Russian troops in March of 1945. While recovering from typhoid fever, fever, Rita witnessed the violence and carnage of the final weeks of the war. Rita and her family lived at the Munkach DP camp where they reunited with her oldest brother, Henry. The family made their way to Prague where they rejoined more distant family members. The family stayed in Prague until the immigration was approved in 1949. Rita made her way to Cleveland in 1951. Rita's brother, Henry, passed away in 1961 just days before the unveiling of this Holocaust Memorial Monument. Rita is a lifelong member of Cole Israel Foundation and its sisterhood. She has two children, five grandchildren, and nine great-grandchildren. Lee and Harry Lurer light the third candle. Lee and Harry are the children of Anna and Abram Lurer. Abram was born in 1914 in Brest-Litovsk in what is now Belarus. In 1939, he was newly married with a baby on the way when the Germans attacked. Immediately, restrictions were placed on the Jews. In 1941, Abram, his parents, sister, wife, and young child were sent to the Manjevich ghetto in Ukraine. 
While the ghetto was being liquidated in 1942, he and his family were marching to their graves, prepared by the Nazis, when his mother said to him, you have to try to survive, and a burning desire to live pushed him to escape into the woods. He used his previous experience in the Polish army to survive and fight alongside the Jewish partisans. With the support of local farmers and small towns, and by recovering abandoned Russian armaments, the partisans disrupted German activity as best they could by destroying rail and communication lines. Once the region was liberated, he was allowed to search for surviving family members, but found none. Abram made his way across Europe to Rome, where he worked for the JDC for five years. On his way, he met Hanna, who became his wife in 1947. Anna was from Romania, born in 1925. She was confined to a ghetto in 1944 and was sent to Auschwitz and Ravensbrück. She was liberated in May of 1945 and discovered more than half her family had perished. Anna lived in a DP camp in Austria and was transferred to Rome where she met Abram. In 1950, the Lehrers were allowed to come to the United States. Abram worked for JDC and was an expert carpenter. Anna was a homemaker and a mother. Abram died in 1979 and Anna passed away in 2016. Abram and Anna were active members of Poland Israel. Together, they had four children, three grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. Sarah Radelli lights the fourth candle. Sarah was born in 1929 in Berosova, Czechoslovakia. Sarah grew up with three siblings, grandparents, and many aunts, uncles, and cousins. The Hungarians occupied Berosova in 1939 when she was just nine years old. Her father passed away just a few months before the family was deported to the Isla Ghetto the day after Passover in 1944. A few weeks later, on Shavuos, the Nazis loaded them with a cattle car headed to auschwitz birkenau She was 14 years old and did not know it would be the last time she would see her mother and most of her family again. Fortunately, her older brother, Joseph Schneider, survived. After liberation, Sarah and her brother returned to Beresova and stayed with Christian neighbors, but did not find any other family members there. They went to Prague to live with uncles who had served in the Czech Brigade in Poland. They went to live in the Berenstein Kibbutz in Vienna in 1946, where they trained to live in British Palestine. Sarah and 450 others illegally boarded a ship called the Latrune, headed to Haifa. The British attacked the ship with tear gas and forced them to Cyprus. Sarah married Betzalel Ben Ami Hershkovic in May of 1947. The couple lived in Haifa until 1960 when they immigrated to America along with their two year old son Michael. They settled in Philadelphia where Betzalel later passed away. Sarah and Michael moved to Cleveland in 1969 to live near her brother, uncle, and cousins. Sarah married Louis Frazelli, also a survivor, and the couple lived together for 48 years until Louis passed away at the age of 101 earlier this year. Michael passed away in an accident in 1983. Sarah was a founding member of Green Road Synagogue and is proud to have built it as a memorial for all who perished in the Holocaust. She has served the synagogue in many capacities over the years. Rose Gelbart lights the fifth candle. Rose was born in 1935 in Lesnar and spent her earliest years in Taylor's Poland. An only child with many aunts and uncles, she was four years old when the Germans invaded. Rose recalls being at her grandparents' house when the Nazis gave them 15 minutes to leave. The family was confined to the Zhezhov ghetto where she remembers seeing bodies being piled onto carts. Rose's mother gave money and jewelry to a Polish woman to keep Rose safe. Rose was kept in a dark room all day, and that night she had to be brought back into the ghetto to be comforted by her parents. The next morning, the women and children of the ghetto were ordered to assemble for the Germans, but Rose and her mother escaped and made their way to Warsaw, where they spent the remainder of the war. Her survival in Warsaw was due to numerous righteous Gentiles, especially Adam and Hanka Jack, who were later honored at Yad Vashem. All of Rose's family, but for her mother and one uncle, died in the ghetto. Rose, her mother, and her uncle made their way to Munich, where Rose's mother remarried. The family moved to the United States in 1951. At 15, Rose attended Glenville High School and graduated in 1954. 
Rose married Arthur Gelbart, also a Holocaust survivor, in 1955. Arthur was liberated from Buchenwald, and once in the United States, he joined the army. Rose's mother struggled with the loss of her family for the rest of her life. In the 1960s, Rose helped form the Colesville Sisterhood. In the 1960s, I'm sorry, she formed, helped form the Colesville Sisterhood, sorry. Rose is on the executive board of the World Federation of Child Survivors. Rose and Art have two children and four grandchildren. Lou Muller lights the sixth candle. From a close-knit, working-class, religious family with many siblings, Lou was on his own from an early age, working as a tailor's apprentice. In 1944, Lou was 18 when the Nazis marched into Budapest. Immediately, all the Jews of Hungary were forced to wear the yellow cross. His apprenticeship ended, and he was subscribed to a forced labor camp, repairing railroad tracks which were under, under heavy bombardment from Allied planes. He remembers seeing trailers of Jews being carried out of Hungary. Lou worked at the labor camp from June of 1944 until the end of that year, when partisan fighters and Russian troops liberated the area. At first, the Russian liberators attempted to benefit from the same forced labor the Nazis had forced on Lou and his fellow inmates, but the group escaped after a few days. Lou made his way to Bucharest, Bucharest, where he met an uncle and a brother, but learned there that no one else from his immediate family had survived the war. He learned that he had cousins living in a displaced persons camp at Bergen-Belsen in Germany. He moved to the American zone, where he lived for a few years while waiting to move to Israel. Ultimately, Lou learned of other relatives in Canada and in Cleveland. Lou moved to Montreal in 1948 and happily worked in the clothing industry there until 1955 when he was sponsored by an uncle to come to the United States. Here in Cleveland, Lou met his wife Josephine, also a Holocaust survivor, and the couple was married in 1956. Lou is a member of Oig Zedek Cedar Sinai Synagogue and a lifelong member of the Colesville Foundation. He and Josephine have two children, seven grandchildren, and ten great grandchildren. A seventh candle is lit in memory of the children who perished in the Holocaust by second, third, and fourth generations of Holocaust survivors. Stephen Samoji was born and raised in Hungary after the war. When the Nazis invaded, almost everyone in the family was murdered. His aunt Magda was the only one to survive Auschwitz. His mother Ilona and brother Frank survived a work camp. His father survived forced labor. Stephen was born in 1946 and was referred to as a miracle baby. Aunt Magda became a second mother while his parents did their best to rebuild their lives. After the Hungarian Revolution, the five remaining family members immigrated to America. Stephen never had what most would consider a normal childhood. He spent his life giving his children everything he didn't have growing up. Ilona, Bernard, and Magda's greatest nachos was their children and grandchildren. Stephen and Frank gave them four grandchildren, and now there are nine great-grandchildren. This year, we have lost many more survivors and members of Cole Israel Foundation. These first-hand witnesses to mankind's capacity for evil are an important link to our past and our members and our mem messengers to ensure that we never forget. We admire their courage in life, dedication to the cause of remembrance and education, and mourn their loss along with their families. To them and to the survivors with us today, we promise you that your stories will be remembered always.